one place. Then we're going to turn over to the book of uh, book of Exodus, the book of Exodus. But I want to read us chapter 12 of the book of Isaiah again. We looked at it last week, I believe, and we looked at this. And uh, in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, though thou was angry with me. Thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall you say, Praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Our Father, I thank you for thy word that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light in our path. Lord, I pray, dear God, you would show yourself mighty through it and in it. Lord, I pray, dear God, you would help our hearts on today and our minds to be consumed with Christ. Our Father, I ask you, God, to do that. And thank you for what you are going to do this morning. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And uh, chapter 15 of the book of Exodus. Chapter 15 of the book of Exodus we are looking at this morning. And uh, what got me on this uh, portion of Scripture are two things. Number one, he tells us in verse number two of chapter 15 of the book of Exodus, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will prepare him in habitation. My Father is God and I will exalt him. Does that not sound similar to what we just read over there in Isaiah chapter 12? Oh, thank God that one day, Isaiah chapter 12 is going to come into place and we will be singing that new song. Hallelujah. And that song of salvation that we have now, we can sing now. But can I say, it was a song that was sung uh, back when Israel came out of Egypt. God is my salvation. And then I noticed in verse number uh, 11, he says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? And as we were uh, looking at this year, that there is happiness and holiness. And uh, we look and we can see that there's the beauty of holiness that God mentions. But now we see he is glorious in holiness. Amen. Come on in. Come on in. Good to see you. Miss Corey, it's good to see you. Amen. Y'all go on be seated and uh, make yourselves at home as far as uh, we want you to feel at home. Amen. And uh, yet at the same time, we want you to feel at home. We want you to uh, be aware that this is not just our home, but it is the Lord's house. And I was glad when they said it to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so we find uh, in Exodus chapter 15 that Israel had just come out of Egypt. Do you remember reading about that? Remember reading about Moses and, and the, the Ten Commandments? Have you ever uh, read about those things where they turned up water into blood? They had the frogs and they had one more night, no stinking frogs, one more night in sin. Oh, I had a terrible night time last night, but I, I just want to do it again, is what Pharaoh said. He said, just give me one more night. You can get rid of them tomorrow. Now, I know some of y'all never heard that song. I, that's one of my favorite songs, One More Night with Those Stinking Frogs. And, uh, but Pharaoh said, just, he said, get rid of them tomorrow. He said, I'll take another night with the frogs. I don't understand all that, but that's what Pharaoh did. Then we find out that God had brought about the lies. He brought about the flies. And then finally, the killing of the firstborn. And then Israel came out of Egypt. 
They part, the Red Sea parted as Moses held his hand out and God opened the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went across on dry land. And the Egyptians, trying to do the same thing, were drowned in the Red Sea. The water came in and the Egyptian army was wiped out. And we can find in chapter 14 that their, their, the wheels fell off their chariots. God had broke east, an east wind along and dried up the land so that the Israelites could go through the Red Sea on dry land. And now we come through the Red Sea and they're singing a song. The song that Moses has when they come out of, from out of the Red Sea, Exodus chapter 15. Then sang Moses to the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Let me just say this. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Safety's of the Lord. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but safety of the Lord. The horse, they thought, boy, the Egyptians thought, we got our horses, we got our chariots. We can certainly uh, catch up and bring down the, uh, the people of God who were trying to get away from them. Can I say, it's not going to happen when God's on your, on your side. Oh. If you're doing what God would have you to do, you can get through the Red Sea and the, the Egyptians will be drowned in the Red Sea. God threw them down in the Red Sea. And I see this portion of Scripture, and, and as I read this portion of Scripture, I want to look at this uh, thought about the glorious in holiness. Now, before I get there, I want you to, have to ask you, what is holiness? That's the question we must ask. Because there are those who think holiness is that I don't smoke, I don't dip, and I don't chew, and I don't kiss on women that day. All of a sudden they say, well, I'm holy. Because I don't cuss and I don't fuss. I'm holy. Can I say that we saw, and we looked over in the book of Isaiah chapter 58, that those people did all those things right, and yet they were not holy because they were not separated unto the Lord. They were, had high standards, but they had no separation unto God. Holiness is unto the Lord. Holiness is not what you do, but it's what you do because of what you are. Many try to do it to make themselves something. I'm going to practice holiness and then I'll be holy. Can I say that's backward? You don't bark to become a dog. I say rub, rub, rub all day long and I do not look like Penny. That's my dog. Don't you look at me and say I do look like Penny. Oh no, she's starting to look like me because she's, oh yeah, she's looking good. She's a beautiful little dog. No, I'm not trying, I'm trying to tell you. I can even say bark, 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 rub, rub, rub all day long and you don't become a dog. You can sit there and you can go through all the motions and go about to establish your own righteousness and not to be the the righteousness of God. You're not going to make yourself holy. You'll make yourself a Pharisee because you'll become proud in your holiness. Holiness is what God works in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Right. And we let that thing work out from what's the inside of us. It's the Spirit of God doing the work. Amen. There are many to die who are trying to get some movement upon them to force themselves to be holy. Can I say God just works in you and works in you and works in you. And as you yield yourselves unto God, as those that are alive and dead, your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And you let God work. And you don't fight against the work He's doing. 
What he does is he makes you more like Jesus. And let me see that. That is holiness. For he is holy. He said, be holy for I am holy, saith the Lord. <clears throat> he is the example of holiness. He is the expression of holiness. He is the exactness of holiness. Matter of fact, he's called the brightness of his glory and express image of his person. Upon all things by the word of his power. And when he is by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Oh, and he's there ever living to make intercession for us. Jesus Christ is our example of holiness. He said, I do always those things that please the Father. Why did he do that things that please the Father? Because he loved the Father. And he said, if my love abides in you, my words abide in you, the Father will love you. If you love the Father, guess what's going to happen? You're going to live for the Father. If you love the Lord Jesus, you know what you're going to do? You're going to want to live for the Lord Jesus. One of the worst things about life is that people say they love somebody and they don't love nobody but themselves. You say, why is that? Because love constrains us to live. The love of Christ constrains us to live for Christ. Holiness is our living with Him being our focus. With Him being our fixation. My heart is fixed, O oh Lord. My heart is fixed. And so I want to look at this thought from chapter 15 of the book of Exodus. Who is like unto thee, O oh Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness? I want to tell you a few things about this one who is glorious in holiness. Now, let me say this. Holiness, the glorious and holiest means that holiness enlightens us. Matter of fact, it does enlighten. Holiness enlightens. Verse number 20 of uh, chapter 14, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that one came not near the other all the night. It enlightened their lives so that they could cross over the Red Sea. Glorious and holy. When the glory of God shines, he's the bright, Christ is the brightness of his glory. When the glory of God shines in holiness, that's what brings the glory of God to shine. It's holiness. If God was not holy, there would not be any glory. Because glory comes from holiness. So they needed deliverance from Egypt and God lightened the way. Not the Egyptians couldn't see the light. They did not see the glory of God. But the Israelites saw the holiness of God and the glory of God. And they, and they said, we're going through the Red Sea, the brightness of His glory, Christ is the light, and He'll light your dark ways. It's dark at night, but Christ is the light. That cloud that they could not, the Egyptians couldn't see in that night because they could not see the light of God shine the light so the Israelites could cross over the Red Sea in the middle of the night. A dark night. A dingy night. But God said, I'm going to have a glorious light. Holiness always enlightens. When you and I find ourselves in bondage or on a battlefield, all we need to do is look for the highway of holiness. Oh, as Isaiah 35 would call it. And get on that highway of holiness and go forward. Why? Because God has exalted this highway to a place where we can see Him. Thus saith the high and lofty one that had eternity whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with Him also a humble and contrite spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, revive the heart of the contrite one. God wants you to understand that there is gloriousness in holiness and in enlightenment 
It is it's, it's very enlightening. But not only do I find that it's enlightening, but it's enlivening. It enlivened them. God in His holiness making a way for them. A, a narrow way, but it was a highway. A straight way, but it was a highway. It went straight through the Red Sea. God had parted the sea. Do you remember this? It made a highway through the sea that they could see. And can I say when God did that and enlightened them, that we can find that God led the Israelites into this wilderness, and there was mountains on one side, mountains on the other side. They were between the mountains on one side, they couldn't climb up, mountain on the other side, they couldn't climb up. They were between the devil and the deep red sea. Amen. I know somebody says the devil and the deep blue sea is the red sea. I want to make sure you understand that. And so there they are. The, the, the Egyptians are behind them, chasing them down. Said we've got them entangled in the wilderness. They're entangled in the wilderness. And then here they are going there. And as a matter of fact, that's, I think that's exactly the words he used. He said, uh, Pharaoh will say to the children of the children of Israel, they're entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And there they are saying, what are we going to do now? But God made a way of holiness. And as uh, Moses lifted up his hands and moved his rod out there, and God split the Red Sea in chapter 14, in verse number 21 or 20, and it came, it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. It was a cloud of darkness to them, but it gave light to the night so that, no, so that the one came not near the other. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Now you say, well, I, I don't see how that could happen. I don't see how it could happen either. But can I tell you, if I saw it happen, it would enlighten me. Boy, if God told me to go through the Red Sea and that they, he parted it and he put a wall of sea on one side and a wall of sea on the other side, I'd just go on through. You say, how do you, but, but do you think it'll last? If God did that for me, I think it's going to last. If God told me to go through it, you say, well, I don't believe that happened, really. This is for believers only, as Brother Chris Hewitt would say. Let me say, if you didn't believe it, then you wouldn't believe it. But they saw it. Seeing is believing. They saw it. But can I tell you, for us, believing is seeing. We can see the Lord and His beauty and the beauty of holiness and the glorious of His holiness. Why? Because we believe. Not blessed are they who see and then believe, but blessed are they that believe and they shall see the glory of the Lord. It's enlivening. God enlivened his lives. And he can me say, what if God showed you the path through your problem? What if God showed you, would that not enliven you? If you had struggles in your life, you're saying, how do I get out of these problems that I'm having? What, how do I get out? How do I get through this? Maybe you're struggling with some sin. Maybe you're struggling with some situation. You say, how do I get through it? Can I say the glories of holiness? The highway of holiness. God made a way through this situation. We can see in verse number 22 that Israel went into the Red Sea. We can see in chapter 14, we can see in verse number 29 that Israel walked through their situation. But the children of Israel walked upon the dry land in the midst of the sea. And we can see in verse number 31 that Israel worshipped the Lord. They saw the great work which the Lord did in the Egyptians and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. And they sang a song. Oh, that God is their salvation. Oh, that He's their strength and their song. 
And he's glorious in holiness. He's triumphant gloriously. Verse number 15, or chapter 15, verse number 1. He had triumphed gloriously. He's glorious in power, verse number 6 tells us. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. And we'll find his excellency in glorious. Verse number seven, in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. And let me say this, if, they, if, the, if enemies rise up against us when we're living for God, then they're rising up not against us, but against God himself. The key is, are you going to live looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? For he excels. In holiness. He does not just enlighten by holiness, but he does not just enlighten by holiness, but he excels in holiness. Hannah made this statement in the first Samuel chapter 2. He says, She said, My heart rejoices in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth is enlarged over my enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. For there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. I want you to understand, when you see God bringing you through something, you'll be sitting there saying, He's glorious in holiness. He's everything. He excels beyond all the glories of all the world. All the glories of all the gods of this world. All the glories of everything else in this world because of God's holiness. He excels them all. He excels in holiness. Holy and reverent is His name, Psalm 111 tells us. That's His name. Holy, holy, holy. Whose name is holy, He tells us in Isaiah 57. Isaiah 6, the seraphim are crying, Holy, holy, holy. In Revelation 4, verse 8, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is, it is to come. I mean, they saw Him in His holiness. There is a light of holiness. There is light in holiness. Oh, Mm -hmm. He's holy. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Amongst all, here he is, they're coming out of Egypt. They're in Egypt, and they've got the gods of Egypt. They're all around them. And they're saying, who is like unto thee, among the gods? Chapter 12, in verse number 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Who's like they among the gods? Here they are coming out of Egypt. They're asking, hey, all the gods of Egypt that they have raised up, are any of them like you? Are any of them glorious in holiness? Are any of them so pure and lovely and righteous? Are any of them right all the time? Can any of them excel? Can any of them give life? Can any of them give true light? What about all the gods of this world? Pharaoh had worked the people of God. Pharaoh had watched the people of God for all these years. And he wondered, why would they trust a God who has done nothing for them? Who would leave them in bondage for so long? Oh, but when God showed up to set them free, oh, can I tell you, oh, he doesn't have to ask that question anymore. All oh, the princes of this world that the people worship. Can I just say this? There are people that worship the government. Not in America anymore. Amen. That's a... There are people that worship the government and think that our government will solve all the problems. Can I say the government can't solve the problem? They can't even get themselves right. 
They might think they can solve problems. They throw money at every problem there is, and they find out that money doesn't solve problems. I just said, I, I just stop there for just a second. Money won't solve your problems. You say, but if I had more money, it won't solve your problems. Your problem, if you need money, is discontent. God can solve your problems. The government. But they knew nothing. Pharaoh knew nothing of the glories of God. The powers of God. Pharaoh knew nothing of all these things. Matter of fact, in Exodus chapter 5, in verse number 2, he makes the statement. This is really interesting. For all that he had seen, he had no idea that there was a God. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. For 400 some years, he had worked. For 400 some years, he had watched. The pharaohs did not know God. I wonder if you people you work with and watch you, if they see God working in you and through you. Is our God glorious enough in holiness that it will change our lives enough to where the world would say, listen, those people have something I don't have. He was still looking at the God of Egypt. The world will defy God, but the world cannot defeat God. The world may defy God, the world may deny God, but the world cannot defeat God. All the governments of this world, the world may suppress God's people. The world may scatter God's people. Matter of fact, in chapter 5, they said we want to put more bondage on God's people. Then he says, you know what? We want to scatter them around Egypt so they can look for straw. But the world cannot stop God's people when God shows up to save God's people. Who is likely to be among the gods? The leaders in the government. Who is likely to be among the gods of the world? Who is likely to be? The god of pride. They had pride in their great river, Nile. You know this. The river where they could go and bathe. They could go and swim. They could go and have a good time. They could get their boats out there. Oh, yes, there was pleasures in this river. Can you picture them getting their motorboats out there on the Nile? Oh, and going skiing on the Nile. You said they didn't have motorboats in those days. They do it nowadays. Just picture it nowadays. They, they got whatever they had. I mean, they weren't riding on alligators, I guarantee you that. But uh, that's a different story. But they, they get out there and they have pleasure in the river. When you go down in the river and you, you, you see all the people. Now, I'm telling you, I grew up around the Mississippi River. And, you know, we'd go out to the river and we'd start a fire and we'd sit there and just watch the river. We'd watch boats go up and down the river. We'd, watch, we'd go out and wade in the river. We'd go out and swim in the river. You know why? Because the river is a place of pleasure. But not only was the river, and, and so Egypt had the greatest river, the Nile. That great river. It's the great river now. It's bigger than the Mississippi. I know America's got all the great things. Let me say Texas says everything's bigger, bigger than Texas. Texas doesn't even have the Mississippi River. Huh, what about that? They got the red on the north and the Rio Grande on the south. Huh, the Grand River on the south. There's nothing you can even get. Man, I ain't even get into that. Very much. People cross that river. Try crossing the Nile. They did. 